ultimately what AI does is probably get put the SDR function back under marketing. For my first five sales hires, I would never hire somebody out of network. I can tell you no great VP of sales is ever going to take a job with a company that's dependent on an outbound go-to-market model. That's just, nope. Brandon, I am so excited for this. I've wanted to make it happen for a while. It's been a while since we last chatted. So thank you so much for joining me today. Also, uh, great to be here. Yeah, I think it was uh, last time we saw each other was maybe in Napa, like some years ago, I think. Um for, for like a SaaS retreat. So yeah, it's great to see you. Brandon, I was young back then, but I want to start with a little on you, just the context. You, still, you still look good, trust me. So <laughs> I, I look like freaking Benjamin Button, but tell me, how, do, how did you first make your way into the world of sales? And when did you realize you loved sales? I was sort of coming into the tech world uh, around like ni- 1999. 2000 was the beginning of my career, which is hard to believe I've actually been around that long. I started my career as a recruiter. So this is before the dot-com bubble burst, which there's not a lot of people that have that as a reference point today. I was a recruiter. We worked with venture-backed companies sort of around sort of helping them build their leadership and management teams. That was really my first job out of college. Came in at sort of the height of it, and then the entire market collapsed. And then recruiting became literally the first thing, you know, that's the first. Oh, recruiting fees? Yeah, that's just, yeah. That's not even, there's not, that's a five second discussion. And so that became like, you know, an incredible career experience because it was like survive. Okay. How do we survive doing this? Because no one needs it. Certainly nobody wants to pay for it. Everyone's firing people. No one's hiring people. Um, what now? Um, and so that forced all of us, we were all really young and a lot of people, um, sort of didn't make it. Uh, but the, those of us that did, um, it's, you know, I, I can't imagine, you know, it's so foundational in my career, um, that it's, you know, I can't imagine not having gone through it. What did you take away from it? That really shit hard time. How did it impact your mindset? Yeah. I mean, we, we didn't really, we weren't really that experienced. So we had to, I mean, it, this might sound bad. We had to basically invent versions of ourselves that weren't real. And we had to convince people that those were real that we had a level of experience and knowledge and expertise that we didn't really have, but we had to convince everyone that we did have. And that that's a pretty good primer to get into sales, right? Where it's like, you know, like, um, you, you are constantly having to kind of reinvent yourself. You have to be able to be, uh, very adaptable to whomever you're talking to, whomever the customer is. And that's something that we had no choice, but to, to look, to, learned to be that it was be that or be gone. And so, you know, we were these 24, 25 year old kids, you know, a lot of them from New York. I was from here in the Bay area, but, um, convincing people with, you know, 20, 25 years of experience that we had, we knew things that were, um, uncommon. Um, and you know, that's, yeah, it was pretty great experience. And every single one of the people that were there, They've all gone on to like incredible success because nothing will ever be harder than that. Brendan, how do you analyze where we're at in the sales playing field today? We got on the call and you said, you know, oh, navigating today. How do you analyze where we're at today? I think the way I would analyze it is, you know, anything, anything 24 months or older, right? That we're in a, it's, we're in a, a space of clay you know, of putty and, and basically most of what we knew is off the books, has no relevance anymore, um, to how we go to market, to how we build sales teams, um, SDR teams, everything is, we're very much in a place where it's like, the more you can unlearn (laughs) your, the more that you can walk away from bad habits and things that we thought were true that aren't anymore, the better off we're all going to be, um, which is not a, not a comfortable place to be for most. What are the biggest things we need to unlearn with sales teams? I think the like, let's spend $10 to make a dollar in how we go to market and how we build go to market and sales organizations is over. Maybe that will be, maybe that will be a thing again someday, but it's no way to run a business anymore. And so you can't do it that way, right? And every single, I mean, as you know, right, you talk to startups every day. Every startup is is laser focused on break even and profitability and long term sustainability. And you can't, you know, 
the customer, the CAC costs of five years ago are not, not even considerable. Um, the entire outbound go-to-market SDR model has collapsed in the last five years, three years, um, and it doesn't work anymore. Um, a lot of the ways that we have traditionally done sort of like mar sort of marketing demand generation have long since not worked. And so, yeah, it's, it's everyone's sort of in the, uh, a lot of people are in the space of, okay, what now? That's, that's my general state of the state. You, and so you have every, every hire has to be like a TEDx, you know, a TEDx scrapper. So what now is PLG content scaled low CAC? the only way forward well i mean i think that's that's probably a podcast series um <laughs> i don't know that i can answer it in one sound but you know what i'm working on is around like you know sort of how to how do you leverage sort of relationships and influence around people that are close to your customer to um to accelerate yourself in the market via like relationships referrals nudges influence um but yeah you know my conviction is that the the whole like outbound sort of sdr model is, is over do you think the world gets that because there's still many outbound sdr models and teams are still operating in that way i don't think it's a matter of getting it it's a matter of in lieu of better alternatives what what else would you do right so i think it's like okay i think most people know this probably isn't going to work it's expensive um everyone's probably going to fail generally but what else do we do? The Uber difference between now and 10 years ago in SaaS is that there's just, there's so much glut in every sort of vertical, right? There's a thousand companies competing for attention from one buyer when, you know, you go back 15 years ago and that was five for 10 companies. Um, and so how are you going to like mass produce some sort of out quasi personalized outbound go to market model that's going to engage people that are going to engage by a thousand other companies the exact same way. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's the as, a, as existential dilemma everyone's facing. Does that not only worsen when you think about AI's impact on outbound? That's an extraordinarily fluid discussion, I think. Um, I think ultimately what AI does is probably get put the SDR function back under marketing, ultimately, when you can maybe accomplish the tasks of multiple in one with one, um, I think a lot of the problems we have today, you can loosely trace back to like the total shift from demand gen being in the hands of marketing and, um, into sales from marketing, which has been a 10 plus year shift. And that's, I, I can tell you no great VP of sales is ever going to take a job with a company that's dependent on an outbound go to market model to grow. That's just, nope. Bye-bye. It's, it's, and they may be more uh, circumspect with a founder and, and telling them why they're not coming, but behind the scenes with other sales leaders, they're going to be like, not even close because they know the, the, they know it's probably a fait accompli at that point. That company is probably not going to make it. And so more and more companies, right? Like I, I've, I talked to, you know, I've probably advised 60 SaaS companies in the last 10 years. You talk to many, many founders. And the question I ask is like, well, why'd you start this company, right? What was the problem that you wanted to solve? And a lot of people can't answer. They can't, they can't answer the question. And to me, it's like, I can't even fathom anybody actually starting a software company and not knowing what problem they wanted to solve um or why they wanted to why they were the person to solve that problem so we always hear the term sales playbook uh i'd just love to hear how do you define what a sales playbook is today brandon i mean it's it's not it's not a canned response it's it's every company i've ever worked at or been a vp of sales for the playbook was completely different than the one before or the one after right so it's um it de it depends on a lot of factors depends on um, but yeah, I think it's a basic of here's our customer, here's our idea, here, here are our different customer personas, understanding the pain and psychology that exists in their world. So I've always been a big believer in sales playbooks need to be very, very rooted in what is, what is the customer thinking? Not what is the customer thinking on behalf of a company, but what are they thinking? What is their personal, um, 
what is their personal opportunity and fear and upside? And I've always focused sales cycles on selling to a person, not to a company. Uh, and I think that that is pretty unique in my career. And that's why, you know, these companies that are like spend hours and hours doing um, discovery calls, especially in this day and age, it's like, I can't, how do you not know <laughs> what the customer's problems are? You should know what their problems are and what their psychology is before you ever get on the fucking call, right? Like that's just, that's 0, 0.0 level. If you need to get on a call and spend two and a half hours doing discovery on your own behalf, then you shouldn't be on, you're not on my sales team. I don't understand. How are you supposed to know what customer, like every customer is so different. It's because you be like, you're, you're, you're an expert, <laughs> right? These are people that you're talking to every day. Right there, it's their 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 problems and their pain is not infinite, right? So it's like usually there's like maybe there's three different paths. What the opportunity or problem here is is one of three paths or four paths, and you better know exactly what those look like and what every turnoff is on those paths before you ever get on a call with a customer. And if you don't know them, then, you know, your VP of sales probably isn't very good. I, 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 I love it. We're coming out with hot takes today. I, I understand what you're saying, though, in terms of the persona, the, it's, the language. It's not rocket science. And, like, it's not if, you, if that's what you do, if you spend all your time talking to, if you sell to VPs of sales or VPs of marketing or CFOs or whatever, you should know more. You should know as much about them as they know about themselves. Um, and you should know. You know, based on like, you know, how the beginning of the call goes, you know, okay, I know this, I know that this is, this is the world he sees. That's what everything I'm going to talk about from this point forward, everything I'm going to show this person, everything, you know, everything's going to be about, you know, I know that this is, you know, this is his true pain here. Like this is his true opportunity. Every great team I've been on knew that they knew it and they, they had it mapped out. And there was never, ever a scenario where you got on a call and you're like, oh, my God, I never thought about that, that that could be a problem, right? Like, what are we fucking doing, man? <laughs> like, And that's where, like, discovery, I've been talking about this for years, and there's, trust me, there's a ton of people that vehemently disagree with me. I, I've advised for companies, and that's all they did was discovery, right? Hours upon hours of discovery, literally where I listened to the calls, and they were like, they would not let that customer get into a sales cycle, right? It was like, you know, it was like some sort of purity test, right? Um, and like, to me, discovery is a means to an end, right? Discovery is, you know, like if you're expecting to close deals in discovery, never seen it once in my life ever, um, both as an advisor, consultant, running teams. Like you should, discovery is five minutes. That's what discovery should be. And if you need more than five minutes to do discovery, then you really you're not putting the work in to understand who your customers are. So my teams have always done discovery and everything else, right? If it's a 30 minute call or a 45 minute call, we're going to, you know, we're going to map it out, lay it out and play it out. Right. There, but like to, especially now where you're competing with a thousand other companies for attention for a buyer and you're not actually going to show them anything. If they're going to give you their time, like you're fucking nuts. <laughs> like if you do that, in my opinion, but you know, Trust me, there's plenty of people that completely disagree with my take there. So, and, and God bless them, Miro. Should the founders be the one to do the playbook, like to create the first playbook? Yes, the, the principles of the playbook, yeah, for sure. Like the broad stroke, the outline, whatever you want to call it, right? With, But don't fill it in with, uh, with permanent ink. But sure, you should have a sketch down and say, hey, here are the things that's worked. Here are the plays that work. This is how we do it. This is how we run it. If you're going to be in as the first salesperson, you'll probably have seen it. You'll have seen them in action multiple times. Ultimately, the playbook um, the f in ink should probably be written by the VP of sales. But yeah, you should have a you know sort of a loosely uh, built playbook. As a founder, I mean, I'm a co-founder. We we close 100. percent You know, we just became profitable in my startup. We close all of our deal own deals myself and the co-founder. We don't have any salespeople. Well, other than us. I'm a hypothetical founder in this situation and you're advising me. Um, should I hire a VP of sales first or should I hire sales reps first? I would say most founders are pretty involved in early sales. 
I would say if they're not, it's probably not good. So let's just assume that's the scenario. Yeah, you should not hire a VP of sales as your first sales hire. It, obviously, Jason Lundkin has has evangelized that. I, I agree with it, generally speaking. Um, I think if you're a founder that doesn't know what they're doing from a sales standpoint at all, and they can't, maybe they either don't want to engage or they don't know how, then it's, I think some of those assumptions have to be revisited of what you do. Um, but obviously the best SaaS companies have pretty active founders in early go to market. Do you agree with Jason in hiring two sales reps at a time? Generally, but again, it's it's a case by case basis. If you hired I mean that the the advantage certainly EchoSign did that back in the day, you know, back in the day, which I would say the climate EchoSign was in much more like today than five years ago, right? Like we were, you know, just coming out of the subprime meltdown from an economic standpoint. Things weren't great. Um, we were definitely like, you know, trying, you know, we didn't want to raise another dime of funding. And so we were trying to grow or get, you know, we were trying to drive profitability through growth, right? Efficient growth. Ideally, I mean, one of the advantages of hiring two is you can hire two different types of people. Um, and, you know, like, because you don't know exactly like what kind of, and I mean, there's all sorts of uh, sub very sub context to that, uh, that I think changed the equation a little bit. Like, are you hiring people, you know, right? Like, you know, like I believe personally, you know, from my first five sales hires, I would never hire somebody out of network ever. Um, I either like somebody that I know and someone that's worked for me or somebody that's vouched for by somebody I trust. Um, those would be, because those are foundational hires. You really can't afford to get those wrong. And you can't afford to compete against any other company that's subscribing to ZipRecruiter or whatever, you know, like wherever else you found this person and the odds of you like being able to, you know, I mean, sales people are notorious liars. Uh, I've never, I've never seen a re sales resume that was hundred percent honest. And so it's really, really hard to assess sales people cold, really, really hard. We could talk about, Oh, like, best practices and processes, but it's just a shot. In the, it's just, a, you know, it's just a shot in the shit, you know, um, you know, like there are things to de-risk it, but basically if you, if you, your first sales hires are just off the street, it's a bad sign um, because the odds are that they're not, you know, it's tough to do. It's tough to do. It's tough to, as you know, right. Nine, you know, 95 and a hundred will die probably is the current rate of things. If that's the case, then you should assume 95 out of 100 salespeople can't do it. Um, and so to assume that you're just going to find them on the street or in ZipRecruiter or CareerBuilder or wherever else they, they came is, you know, the odds are going down fast there. And so for me, my first five sales hires are always going to come through. P people vouch for my people I know and people that I trust where there's some skin in the game. So what do you do if you don't have a network? What if you do if you don't know the five? So if you have investors, quote, hypothetically, you have some access to some sort of network. So if you have investors, that's one place to start. Although investors are you notoriously bad hiring recommenders. I'm sure I know you're different. <laughs> but most, most investors and VCs, like, they make a recommendation. And my advice would be, like, just, 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 no. Like, it's great that they work, you know, that you were on the board of a company 15 years ago and they were great then and stuff. But like, um, so I'd say, yeah, like if, if you don't have investors that can recommend good people and you don't have your own network, I would get advisors or influencers in your space, right? Um, that have, you know, and make them partners, you know, give them equity and maybe pay them because their, their recommendation probably has more credibility than your own company, right? Um, their voice has more visibility than you. And so go out and create a, a five person advisory team. That's, you know, that's great. Um, how do you do that? Well, <laughs> on some level, at some point, people have to figure some of it out for themselves, right? So, so let's say we, we enter this hiring process, even if we do have the network, we still need to go through a process. If you were to structure the process for hiring reps, 
How do you structure that hiring process? I've always, for me, the the sort of signature moment in a hiring process for a salesperson, I would always, we would always have them do a demo, right? We'd always have, or have them run a, like a, run a like close to game condition sales call. It's possible. Um, what we used to do is we'd say, okay, sell, you know, pitch us echo sign, sell us echo sign as a like prospective customer. And then I became, you know what, look, let's just have them sell what they sell now, right? Like, you know, whatever their product is today, have run this sort of mock sale or mock pitch based on what they currently sell or have most recently sold. And so that was sort of the evolution of that. And basically that was the ultimately for any candidates, we could talk about how they would get to that stage, but like that was the determining factor. And like, so at talk desk, we had like a panel as myself and like my first three sales hires and we would listen to them pitch that and we would say it has to be unanimous all of us have to sign off on this person um and that was sort of how we would you know go up or down in that process obviously that creates a pretty high standard but the logic was sell me what you sell today if what you sell today if you if that's not a compelling story then why is it going to be compelling here right <laughs> like you know and so we would have people that we were like yeah we really like this person um you know going through the interview process and they would, they would do their pitch and be like, yeah, that's no way. Like they can't animate what they sell. Certainly we could probably help them on the margins, but the bottom line is it's not compelling in any way. They've been there for however many years and that's the best they can do. Um, that's a, I think that's a pretty good litmus test for a hire. I would never do it. I would never hire a salesperson without doing that. I mean, there's, for like SDRs, there's obviously there's a whole other set of stuff for an SDR, but hiring SDRs is usually about hiring a set of like characteristics because they're mo most SDRs are not 10 year SDRs. They're early on in their career. And so you're looking for, pe you know, people that have the characteristics that are coachable that you can mold and develop in the way that you do it. Do you ever hire people who haven't been reps before where you can coach them and they have the aptitude and skills, but they haven't been reps before? Obviously, I want to hire a network for my first three to five hires. Um, you know, people that are ideally someone, at least one that has worked for me before, where I know that whatever the conditions are on the ground, like they've seen it before and they can, they can live in that world. Like once you get beyond that, then, then I'm mostly focused on like aptitude and talent. You're trying to find talent and coachability and ambition and work ethic. Um, versus like, oh, this guy was a sales force for 10 years. I, I won't ever hire that person in a startup generally, right? Because there's no, no comparable motion, right? Versus I, I'm selling for a Fortune 1000 tech company. Everyone knows who we are. Everybody has budget, um, you know, versus you get on a call and there's no acknowledgement that there's even a problem. Like the problem that you want to solve, there's no agreement or even understanding that that problem exists. Can you live in that world um, where you have to, you know, you have to convince them it's a, it's a legitimate problem um, to even examine, like there's no comps there for like Salesforce or Oracle or Adobe or whatever, right? You don't ever have to make that kind of case there ever. Um, so yeah, I'm looking for people that, that want to sign up for that fight that have the characteristics and the talent. And so like talk desk, after like our first three or four hires, we were hiring young, up and coming, smart, ambitious, coachable, and every single one of them are VPs of sales now. How do you incentivize them financially and are sales reps coin operated? I think that's one of those, that's a super fluid concept, right? Because I think the way that we've compensated salespeople like five years ago is probably like null and void now. Um, obviously I don't, I'm not paying any salespeople right now. Like, um, we're, you know, we're founders, we close deals. We're not paying ourselves commission for those. Um, I would say the echo sign model is a great model for times like this, right? Which was pay a really high percentage after they paid for the, after they paid for themselves essentially. Right. Um, and so. Um, every sales rep, that's how we did it. Every sales rep had a like full, full operational cost, you know, of like, this is what they, this is their salary and uh, benefits and this is what it costs. 
And so if you closed a hundred thousand dollar deal and your cost was 15 K a month, we just took 15 K off. So you paid for yourself. And then once you paid for yourself, we paid like 15% after that. I mean, it probably averages out to something more normal, but like that was the way we looked at it was, um, you know, because we were, we were not bootstrapped, but I mean, we only raised like $5 million, I think in the lifetime of the company. So, and none after I joined. And so like every, you know, we wanted to make salespeople profitable as fast as possible. And one of the best ways to make them profitable was to make sure that everyone paid for themselves, right? There, none of them were a cost center. Um, so I would say that's probably a pretty good model for the current time, time, time we're in now. What are the biggest mistakes that founders make when hiring reps? I would say it's first off in the same way, like if you're expecting to hire people off the street, expect a super high turnover rate. It's just, you know, there's a 98% chance that each hire is probably not going to work out. How quickly do you know that it's not working out? You generally know in a quarter, you know, in a quarter, if you know, like you might give them more time. So like I've had people that came in and just were gangbusters right away. And then I've had people that took a little longer, but I knew they were good. What are the signs that it's not working out? I always felt like if I'm on calls with them and I feel like I have to take the call over, you know, and run it for them, you know, like at some point they sh- that's a first step of like, can they run the call in the way that you want it done without where you can be involved and help in, in on the margins, but you don't have to run the call. That's pretty important. A lot of the sales hires I've had that didn't work out, I felt like, I'm like, I, sh- I have to jump in here because it's going sideways a lot and I have to take over and fix it. And it's just not, it doesn't seem to, you know, they don't seem to be getting better at it. Um, and then, you know, like, obviously like I've, you know, I believe in running like really like sort of a monthly tight monthly sort of process, no matter really quite frankly, no matter what your ASP is, that's just what I believe in a startup is the right thing to do because it it's, it makes it really hard for them to push deals out and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I got, that's a verbal commit for three months from now. Um, well, that's not, that's not a verbal commit. It's just, that's a best case deal. And that's the time frame. It's a best case deal. And, but like, you know, when you in, uh, you know, you have, you run a, a tight sales process without too many stages where deals can hide in. Onboarding. You kind of need to give them time and you need training. If I'm a founder, what's the right way to onboard new sales reps to ensure that I'm not jumping in? We can't expect them to hit the ground running from day one. How do we onboard reps the right way? If you're a founder and you have a founder-led sales motion, you know, they need to just be at your hip at every turn, right? Every, you know, every sales call you're on, you know, probably for a few, uh, like a couple of weeks, right? where there's not a lot of expectation put on them, but like, you know, I mean, there's in a startup osmosis is, is the best way to learn. Right. So, you know, have them on your hit, obviously you're using gong or something like that. Right. So you have, you should have a bank of call recordings and demos and, you know, very easy way to like analyze and synthesize that data. You should, you know, have your salesperson listen to like, every sales call, like within reason, right? Or re- that would be relevant to the type of sales cycles they'll be running. I mean, obviously like right now, sales training is not something that people are going to spend a lot of money on, I think generally. Um, so yeah, I would say osmosis, <laughs> um, you know, don't have them, you know, it, without it, you know, it's, they're almost certain to fail certainly. And that's, you know, obviously I was involved in the very, in the early days of Gong that is, that is something that's out there now. I think that's critical for onboarding new salespeople, right? The ability to, you know, sort of tap into like historical record of calls and data and learnings and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I would say that's it. Just get them on your head, have them listen to every call that you have on the books. Do you agree with fire fast when it comes to raps? If that's your philosophy and everyone's getting fired fast or first or whatever, then there's probably something wrong that's maybe not all them. Um, and so if you believe in the hire you made, I don't think you need, I don't think there needs to be a like artificial timeline on it. Um, but like, yeah, I'd say a quarter, you know, a quarter plus some change, you should start to see things going, you know, and like 
we would always say by the second quarter you want to you want to by the end of the second quarter you want to fully ramp salesperson. And if you don't see that, if you finish their first quarter and they fall short, and you're in the second quarter and you don't see them tracking towards that, then yeah, maybe you let them go. But like, there's probably you're probably a big part of the reason why. When you review your mistakes hiring, what are the biggest mistakes you've made hiring sales reps? Being uh, enticed by the resume, right? By the experience. Like, um, you know, you we hired this person at EchoSign. It was like this kind of been there, done that hire. He was at like WebEx. He was at DocuSign. He was, you know, he was at Salesforce. We're like, wow, this guy's amazing, right? And like... You know, we hired him and then turned out that he was, you know, the first day he drove his Harley Davidson right up to the front door, like right to the front door of the office. Right. And yeah, that was like a red flag. Whoa. OK. Um, and so um, and the reality is it was he probably was amazing at one point, but he wasn't anymore. It's looking at a resume and say, seeing like um, bo- boxes checked. Oh, Wow. He was here then, he was there, and then he did this. And I think that's one of the mistakes people make in hiring salespeople is they hire, are you, is that who you're getting, right? Even when the resume looks amazing, are you still getting that person? Or was that person just right time, right place, lucky, et cetera? And discerning between what what looks good on paper and what actually plays is uh, super complex. And it's a complicated thing to to. under, you know, and so most people hire a resume with, you know, names and titles and companies on that resume. And they think that that stands for something, but there's, there are a lot of other, um, layers to that. Like, you know, like, did you do your due diligence on that person? Did you talk to people that knew them had worked with them that, you know, like they, that could vouch for who they were and, or not maybe who they were not, which that has layers <laughs> by the way. Right. Um, but like, yeah, I would say that's, you know, this particular hire I'm talking about, we hired him and he was gone in a month for, you know, we, he was, I walked him out the door in a month and it turned out we had all these incredible young salespeople that were great. We brought this guy in as like, Oh, you know, this guy's better than them. And he wasn't, they, he wasn't even in the ballpark of how good they were. And that it kind of just for us reinforced like, Hey, this is an ultra talented team and let's invest in that team. Let's move those people up. Let's get their DNA across more of this organization, right? Like, um, you know, and so that's, for me, it's all about taking the people that have proven they can do it for in your company and your system with your customers and, and get, letting them run and then taking them as far as they can um, in their career. Cause the odds that you're going to hire someone off the street better than that, are almost zero point fucking zero. Like they have to have some, you know, have sold within the ballpark, right? Of like, it doesn't have to be like, oh, well, you know, it's 5K off in ACV or something. But yeah, they have to have sold somewhat similar type of sort of price point and sales cycle, like velocity wise and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't have to be exact. You know, hiring somebody that's sold, you know, super enterprise nine to 12 month sales cycles at a, you know, like pretty transactional high velocity sales org is not going to work out ever. Unless you're willing to like make an exception for them and say, Hey, I realize you're doing bigger, longer, more strategic deals. So you really have to almost partition them out. Right. Because a lot of times you'll try to hire those strategic people where you have this young, dynamic transactional team, you'll hire this strategic team and they'll see these kids just crushing it. And then there, you know, creates this tension. This happened many, many times. I could walk through the number of companies where it's happened, even ones that I wasn't at. They have to be separate because they're going to see the your this team over here of like Sam Blonde and all these people, you know, like just lighten up the board. And they're going to be like, God damn, man, I need to do something here, you know. And most of the time, it just doesn't work. To be honest, most of the time, you try to like overlay the strategic team. Um, and they, the, the, the failure rate is about 99%, um, just in reality, right? Because the reality is, is 
they probably can't, even though they have all this experience and all this other stuff, they probably can't sell as good as Sam Bond can, right? <laughs> can I ask Brendan, as a leader, I think deal reviews are very important. How do you think about doing deal reviews and what's the right way to structure them, organize them and operate the team to make sure they're most efficient? I mean, most of my deal reviews would start with, you know, obviously we were any communication with the customer, right? Um, so email, we weren't really at a point where like all phone calls were being captured, right? But like basically if there, I was in a deal review and again, remember for us, we were running a monthly reviews, right? Like we were running every month, We every salesperson had, and this is how I've run it in every company I've ever been in and it's worked 100% of the time with various very varying types of sales cycles and types of products but we had a you know everyone would have a monthly commit here are the deals i commit and then here are the deals that i have in best case which are deals that are possible but not committed for this month and that makes it very simple right so like you're breaking a deal down you're like yeah so here's a deal you haven't commit you haven't talked to this customer in two weeks so like, how could that pos- how's that possible? Right. <laughs> like it makes it very simple. I, I, I always look at like customer communication, the correlation to like how possible a deal is are like, there's a, it's like a hundred percent correlation. Right. And so if you haven't emailed with a prospective customer and, you know, usually more, if there's like a three day gap and it's like a committed deal and like, maybe there's a contract in legal or whatever else, you're not closing that deal right? Generally speaking, right? And so that's, that was one of the things that I would always look at is like, you know, where are we at with the customer from a communication standpoint? When was the last time this customer emailed you or called you or returned your call or picked up your call? And if it hasn't happened in three days, it ain't happening generally, (laughs) right? Something's wrong, right? Something's wrong. Not all the time, but usually that was my sort of instinct around it is like, there has to be constant communication with a customer if it deals, you know, when you talk about all of the contracting, legal review and all the rest, there's a very fluid process there. And when there's big gaps in communication, um, I'm like, okay, so let's take that out of commit, right? Should we put it to close lost? What about a lost deal? Someone loses a deal in your team. What do you say to them? What's the answer as a sales leader to the rep who's lost a deal? If it was a committed deal? Yeah. The the consequences, not consequences, but, you know, I always try to view those like they have to feel that or what's the point of committing deals, <laughs> right? And so, you know, we treated that, you know, that was a big deal, right? And that was going to be, you know, sit down one-on-one with a salesperson, which we I did every week with every salesperson, right? And that was, we were going to spend time and say, hey, like, let's talk about why this deal was committed and why it it fell out and you know usually there was you know the warning signs were just obvious blinking red and in some cases i should have seen it you know like talking about like that oh like you know this person hasn't responded to an an email or a call in a week that's not going to close but yeah they would if it was a committed deal that didn't close you know i was i've always felt like that you know they have to feel that some some you know it doesn't have to be like i'm not going to fire anyone for it um, but yeah, it's going to be a discussion. Is there a good reason to lose a deal in your mind? And usually when you lose deals, it's, it's, it's not about, it's what you didn't do, you know, five steps prior, right. Or what you didn't establish or, you know, there's all sorts of stuff when you try to do a post mortem on it, where you can look back and you can say, here are the things that we, yeah, we really didn't solidify these things. There were stones unturned, um, is usually when you do, when you analyze why you lost a deal. And so we were always, you know, our motto was always like, let's turn over every stone. We were so good that we could walk into deals where we were basically, you know, given a blindfold and a cigarette at the beginning of the sales cycle, right? Where our competitor had us beat 10 ways to Sunday. They were in the deal. They had vent, they had partner and vendor support. They had everything imaginable. Um, where we could, you know, we could undo it out of that, certainly that echo sign team. One of the things that we did, I think at a, which was not the norm at that time, maybe it is now is we were sell we were in every layer of the deal, right? We were at this, we were in the C-suite. We were with the evaluators and decision makers, even users, right? If there was some sort of proof of concept or pilot 
and we were going against DocuSign, and DocuSign was maybe at one level in a deal. One level, and we were at three levels. And we were, you know, we were pushing all levels towards each other, right? And DocuSign would lose deals to us, and they didn't understand why. And we were like, yeah, well, you know, you left this, you left your flank completely. <laughs> you you left your flank unchecked, man, right? So and there was a deal we were in at Standard & Poor's. Salesforce walked DocuSide into the deal, right, against us. Said, pick them, right? <laughs> um, we went to New York. This sort of overlaps with one of your questions of it. You talk about a deal where you went outside the box. Sam Blond and I went to New York, um, showed up at Standard & Poor's on a Friday. No one showed up for the meeting. That's <laughs> And we were like, Jesus, we just flew to New York. We're staying in a hotel. <laughs> like, we're this kind of bootstrap startup. <laughs> like, and so I, I think I told Jason, yeah, like, good first meeting. We're going to meet them again Monday, right? And that was what we told that we were able to get them to meet, meet us Monday because now that they, for whatever reason, they all, none of them showed up. We had our VP of product fly out. <laughs> he had to fly back. We show up Monday everyone's in the room and they're like, yeah, so, you know, we're going to pick Salesforce, but, or we're going to pick DocuSign, but yeah, go ahead and make a case, right? <laughs> That's how it started. And, uh, and we beat them because usually when a partner tells you to pick someone, it means that there's a level of due diligence you didn't really do. Um, and so we were like, yeah, like what we would say is, you know, like, do the same thing that Google did and Facebook did. And we just walked through all these companies that had evaluated that had, we'd gone head to head against stock. You sign that. Right. And we said, and, and they did the same thing, right? They didn't, you know, they didn't pick them because a partner, because Salesforce said it, they just did a head to head evaluation and this is how they evaluated it. And this is how they determined. And so do that. And if we lose that, well, great. All hey, you know, we walk away happily, quite frankly, um, and if we win it, then you pick us and you kick them out of the room <laughs> um, because, you know, like that's the same decision that everyone else made. And so we at that point, Facebook, this year, Facebook was a super high profile, right? Facebook was like the hottest company in the world. So we were really and we had just beaten DocuSign at Facebook. We were really leaning heavily into that. And they were like, we're standard and poor. What do we care about Facebook? And I was like, well, I think their valuation is worth more than you, right? <laughs> um, anyways, that was, that was a judgment call in making that, that statement. But like, yeah, we, we just beat in. So DocuSign had just, that's all DocuSign did was go C-suite, Salesforce's endorsement. But there, was all, there were two other layers of people, right? Evaluators and users that were, and then we just basically, Sam and I were like, yeah, and at that, at this point, it's like, it's just, that's all we just want to do is just beat them. Right. And so we were checking in on every evaluator and, and user every day. Right. Like literally it was like rehearsing a witness statement with them, you know, when they went to sort of provide their feedback back to the C-suite and DocuSign had never even talked to any of them. Right. They had just sat on their fat asses. Right. And said, um, yeah, we, we played the C-suite and we played the partner investor card with Salesforce and we got our asses kicked. Um, and that was, that was one of the most rewarding deals ever I've ever done in my career because we had no business winning the deal. We had no business even trying. Um, but we just said, we're just going to do everything right from here. And you know, if we lose, okay. But like if we win, man, how good is that going to feel if we do win? That was back 13 years ago, you know, 12 years ago, that was pretty innovative. I think now it's more the norm. You, you can't really not do it now. So, Brandon, I want to move into a quick fire. I love that as a creative story, though. That is fantastic. So I say a short statement. You give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound OK? Sure. So what sales tactics have not changed over the last five years? Not changed. Salespeople that are dependent on an SDR team to drive their own deal flow is uh, going to be a timeless recipe for success. Tell me, on the flip side, what sales tactics have died, Brandon? Kind of outbound SDR models, very much in flex. I think AIs, I think I really do think the SDR, outbound SDR function is going to fall back under marketing, which is probably where it should be. There was a quantum shift 10 years ago, and it's going back. I think it goes back, especially with AI, the 
the onset of AI. I think that is a place AI can really help solve and fix, but that's a big deal, right? To sort of take demand generation out of sales, which I don't think any VPs of sales really want to own that, quite frankly. Um, at least outbound, like in that, that sort of SDR function. Um, I think that's going to fall under marketing. I think that's a pretty big quantum shift. An ultimate one. What would you most like to change about the world of sales? The stuff I'm working on is a passion project for me um, because I've just seen that the, that go-to-market model for startups is so daunting. There's just so much noise you're competing against that the traditional ways to get in front of customers is, cha- is changing and maybe change forever. And so, yeah, that's... You know, I just, yeah, the the world I want to see is a world where you're starting out your sales process as close to the customer as possible as a way to sort of mitigate a lot of risk in, in how startups grow. That's the thing I believe most in, right, is that going to market on the backs of, you know, like a sort of let's just go crank out 100,000 emails and make a 1,000 calls. I never really believed in it. It was like one of those things that everyone just kind of had to like, okay, yeah, 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 well, yeah, we'll do that, sure. And we, you have to do it as well as possible, but I never believed that that was ultimately going to scale and it has not. That's what's most interesting to me. Final one for you. What one yeah. company sales strategy have you been most impressed by recently? Certainly Rippling. I think pretty impressive what they've done. Um, you know, the CRO he used to work on was on our team at EchoSign back in the day. And uh, Matt Plank has done an amazing job there at Rippling. Um, so that would be the one number one. And certainly there's a lot of people on that Rippling team I know. And there's a lot of talent on that Rippling team, um, which is one of the advantages. Of, like when you're the one company just crushing it in a down market is you can get you can really just build super teams talent wise. And I think they have. Everyone else is like companies that have adjusted <laughs> to, you know, the state of the state, right? So like later stage unicorns, right, that are figuring out like, oh, crap, things have slowed. And what do we do now? Like Talk Desk is certainly like a company that w- had a really went through a tough period and they've now completely course corrected from everything that I know, like doing really, really well now. And that's hard to do. I think for the, a lot of those unicorns, that's hard, right? When you hit that those bumps, big bumps, maybe chasms, like how do you bounce out of that and get back on a chart, get on a good course again? Um, you know, there's a lot of early stage startups. There's a startup called Lantern I love. It's like a sort of a rippling for the sales cloud type of play. And a lot of those just incredible early founders, a lot of early traction. Um, there's a lot of great pre-seed, seed, startups and founders out there right now which i think is always when the market is down you tend to see a real like um bouncy in that area that's like the you know that's sort of the tech that's how tech mitigates these things you know is in when the risk when the when the risk is mitigated between like a big safe big company and a startup then you tend to see a lot of super talented people flow into the into the early stage world so Brandon, Brandon, listen, I always learn a ton from you. I so appreciate the directness, the honesty, and you've been a fantastic guest, my friend. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good to see you.